Kia ora and hi, I'm Craig John, CEO and Managing Partner of Speakers Institute Corporate. Now this week is a really important week. We have Are You OK Day here in Australia and around the world we have World Suicide Prevention Day. It, it's such an important day where we need to help each other out there and realise it's OK to talk when it, you may be having struggles in life. And so I've brought together a team of panellists here from Speakers Institute Corporate. And we're gonna talk about both the role of communication and leadership in well-being and supporting people when they're struggling in life. So I've got Sam Cawthorn, CEO of Speakers Institute, Christiane War, who's a confidence coach. I have Jessica Kiley, who is a, one of our program designers and also senior facilitators. We also have Diane McCabe, who's a resilience and change coach and senior facilitator as well. Welcome everyone. You know, obviously there are many people around the world at, at different times we struggle, you know, with life and things that we find a little bit difficult to deal with. So Diane, you know, in your life, from your experiences, how have you, how have you found it that you can actually identify when something is not quite right inside yourself? Big question. <laughs> For me, I've struggled with mental health since I've been a teenager. So I've had anxiety, depression, panic attacks. So I've kind of grown up and been used to that. Uh, but what I did notice is in 2016, I had burnout from working in corporate organizations. And that for me was something that was a gradual buildup starting to change over time. And it was probably more that people around me noticed it before I actually noticed it my, myself. But simple things like not going for lunch, not going out to meet my friends or family, coming home in the evening and lashing out at family around me. Um, so for me, it was kind of erratic moods and yeah, just not doing the things that I would normally do that kind of look after myself. And, and sometimes we, you know, from an outsider's perspective, when someone is struggling a little bit, it's sometimes it's subtle, but sometimes it's quite open as well. You know, what have you experienced, Sam? Obviously, I do live with a disability uh, and, you know, I've, I've had my fair share of uh, accidents and so on and so forth. And also those times where really I had no other option but to either give up or actually, you know, fight for my life. Uh, and, and certainly in those crossroad moments, you know, for me, you know, you, you either go into your flight and fight mode or alternatively, you just simply hold on to just that inkling of hope. And I think for me, that's certainly been something really, really imperative in my life in every single part of my journey, whether it has, has been struggles in my finances or relationships or even in my own physical body, how can I continue just to hold on with those inklings of hope uh, in order that maybe there is a better day? And so now, nowadays, I even literally proclaim that over my life every single day. And many, of, many people have heard me say this, and I literally continue to say this, the best is yet to come. And if I constantly say that, I actually believe that the best is yet to come. So that hope for tomorrow is certainly one of the most powerful things that have really helped me. Yeah, and Jessica, you, you've got two beautiful daughters and, and obviously someone who's a, a parent and you're dealing with having your own businesses and working, et cetera, and, and challenges come up in life. How do you, how do you find trying to deal with your own emotions and yourself when you are struggling when you've also got a you, you feel like you have to be up and ready to go for your family and other people and be on the whole time yeah good question craig because we all wear many hats as well we all have lots of roles and sometimes the struggle within can actually be about feeling like you're letting others down and then that can add to the spiral at the same time as well. Um, but for myself and my own experiences through the challenges and the shadows and, and the darkness, um, it has always, I've learned that the most important is to keep my cup full and, you know, to look after myself um, and that idea of being selfish actually being a good thing in terms of looking after yourself because then you are so much more and have so much more available uh, for your work, uh, for your friends, for, for my children, for my family. Um, so it's actually the best thing you can do is take care of yourself first. So Christian, you do a lot of work coaching people and 
when do you know when it's the right person to or the right time to ask a question to someone who you might have seen a subtle change in their body language or their communication or the way they're interacting with you or other people? Great question. So, I mean, physiology is like communication. 93% of communication is nonverbal. So if I notice an evident shift in someone's physiology in their body language, rather than going straight for the jugular, it might be asking a question like, I just noticed a subtle shift or what's going on for you right now? And really open that door and invite them to step through and embrace vulnerability because mental health really can be quite a vulnerable um, situation for a number of people. I think that's really important. And you know, for you, Diane, you've you've obviously had your own challenges, but when you're talking with other people around their resilience or their mental health, how important is the ability to ask a question and then be a real active listener? Uh, the deterrent or the thing that a lot of us tend to do is we jump into fixing mode. So if someone tells us they've, you know, they're experiencing some issues, we want so desperately to help them that we jump in and it's, have you tried this? Have you done this? But giving room to breathe, just they've picked up the courage to speak to you. You're the person of choice for them. Mm -hmm. Giving them that little bit of time to just allow them to say whatever is on their mind is the most powerful thing that you can do. So resist the urge to jump in and fix. Just be there, be present, hold space for them. But men just always want to fix things, isn't it? So <laughs> sometimes it's so hard to listen to someone. Yeah. I have a husband like that, Sam. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> God love him. <laughs> and I think it's good there to remind ourselves of the word well being. Mm -hmm. So being is about in a moment and being in the present rather than doing. So fixing and trying to help is, is an act of doing in a way, right? When actually we are well being is in a moment and sometimes just sitting beside someone and giving them your presence, present. your beingness with them can actually help to lift the wellness. Yeah, I, I really like that. That's also something that I've found as well. I mean, people will open up when they feel safe, when, when, when there's a decent level of trust. And, and so ultimately I will feel safe and, when, and, and even come to a place of uh, trusting someone when I know that someone's purely there, not to judge me, but just simply to listen. And that compassion that I feel and sense from them will actually help me to feel safe and ultimately then open up. And I think, yeah, creating that space is, uh, is such a beautiful, powerful thing. I think it's really interesting. A couple of things have popped up there. One about making sure we don't jump, uh, jump in and fix something or making sure that we are not there to judge people. So, you know, when we're in that situation and we see someone and they start to talk to us and we, and we want to jump in and, and either have an opinion or say something, how can we prevent ourselves? And maybe what some ways that we can actually effectively support that person through that tough time? Uh, I think maybe Diane for this one. It's Number one is just don't judge yourself too harshly, like come from a good place, tap into your actual heart and have that compassion. Sam mentioned the word compassion, have that compassion for other people and imagine what it would be like in their in their situation. But encouraging them to say, have you gone to see a GP? Have you, you know, if you if you're lucky enough to work in an organization where you have an employee assistance program, you know, you know, can I come with you to the GP? Do you want me to have that call with you? Should we go to HR together? And, um, you know, have you spoken to your husband, your wife, your spouse um, about these things? So just asking some subtle questions and you know Christiane's point about watching those subtle shifts if they feel uncomfortable about it then maybe just back off a little bit but be as intuitive as you can and just look for the signs and how they're physically responding to that. Yeah really really important you, you know thinking about kind of prevention stuff as well you know it's um, Jessica touched on there around have, being a well-being you know, for you, Christiane, how important is it for people to, you know, maybe when they are struggling to, to sort of think about what are you grateful for today? Imperative. Gratitude is the best attitude. You know, there's always, always something to be grateful for. Um, even in those darkest of moments, in the deepest, darkest tunnels, you know, on the other end, there is the greatest of light. 
And to piggyback off what some of the other guys have said is, you know, I kind of think of approaching an are you okay conversation as a four step process. Yeah, and it's to ask, to reach out to someone, to lean in and embrace someone if you notice that there are abnormalities in the way that they're being to Jessica's sentiments. You know, so the first one is to ask, are they okay? Are you okay? You know, and then um, per Sam's sentiments in and around creating space, a sacred space, actively listening and enabling that person to recognise that they're being heard, that it's a judgment-free, critical-free zone and what they share will remain strictly confidential. And more than that, you know, encourage action. You know, we're often told change your physiology, change your state. You know, so get moving. There's a lot of power in movement, in exercise, in the great outdoors. And check back in with that person from time to time. You know, how are you going? Are you okay? Are you really okay? Yeah, beautiful. And for you, Jessica, I know you like to get up very early in the morning. You have a routine of, of how you kind of work on your energy first. So talk us through a little bit around what people can do at the start of the day to get to, to work on their own energy so that they can start the day in a great positive frame of mind. I do have a great morning routine um, that came about from those challenging times. So I wouldn't have found them in a way if it hadn't have been for those moments and having to learn and try new things. So like Christiane said, there is light, right, in terms of what we learn and what's on the other side as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like to think of it as, you know, everything is energy and vibration, right? And so even our own energy levels, like our mobile phones, can tend to like go down in batteries, right? They just, they get drained during the day. And the, the, often those um, internal, the internal war that can sometimes happen or the struggles that we're dealing with can actually drain us as well. Um, but there are so many amazing ways, um, beautiful ways that we can actually charge ourselves back up again quite naturally. And you may not even realize how much they, they're helping. So sunrise is a particularly potent time of the day, not only beautiful wise, which, you know, helps us all sorts of scientific research to say when it hits, you know, our visual cortex and what it can then do in terms of releasing the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, all of those types of things. Um, because we're out in nature, nature has a certain frequency that then can impact our frequency, but you're moving as well, right? Like Christiane said, you're getting out of the bed, you're going and seeing, and even if it's not, you can't see a, you know, a picturesque sunrise, you're in the light of sunrise in the morning. You're then in that early morning and you're noticing different rays of light. So there's yeah, lots of things like that that you can do quite easily um, that will then help to charge you up naturally and mm. i love that jess and often the reason we can't is the reason we must rather than hitting snooze think of the goodness that comes through moving through getting up with that sunrise so sam early on you talked about creating that kind of safe space and you know i want to dive into kind of males here a little bit because we, we had the you know for many many years it was you know don't talk you've got to be brave um that it's, it's not a good idea to if you're not feeling well to show that so how can you know men in particular how can we create a safe space for them to speak out and and communicate more effectively when they are having some tough times good question let, let me frame it this way you know there's a reason why the human species is actually top of the food chain uh, you know, if if you look at back at back back in the day, you know, in caveman times, yeah. Let's say let's say you're walking through the jungle by yourself. You are prey. You know, a, a lion or a tiger can come and devour you. An elephant can come and you know bowl you over and the like. And the reality is that when you are by yourself, you are prey. But the moment that you then walk through the jungle with other human beings in a tribe, when, when you're together with other people suddenly then you move from being prey to becoming predator. And, and one thing I love about that is ultimately sometimes we think we can do it all by ourselves, don't we? A lot of the time we think, yeah, I, I've got this. And the reality is us as a species, we we're born to be together, to, 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 to hang out and to be intertwined and interconnected together. And so I cannot encourage people out there enough, you know, 
uh, sometimes we can't put it all on our own shoulders. We can't do it by ourselves. But if you want true power, if you want true influence, if you want true possibilities in your life, stick together. Um, and this is where when you create a safe environment with other people, then there's, an, then there's an ongoing trust there. And then before you know it, you've got an unstoppable team. Very, very good. Diane, you deal a lot in the world of change and you know, people love to be in control. They, they love to have things in place that their normal routines that they're comfortable with. How can leaders support their teams when they're going through change or there's uncertain times? What, what do you think is important for a leader to be aware of? We look at the, the world as it is at the moment, there is so much change and, you know, not just change in the workplace, but there is change in everybody's household. There's change in everybody's community at the moment and change brings stress along with it. So we're not just having the stress of here's one project or one thing that's happening in the business. There is change happening at all levels of an organization, both inside the organization and outside of the organization. And if we think about building people's resilience, if you build their capability in terms of how do they adapt to change? You know, what are some of the structures and processes that are in your organization that help you vet change that, you know, support change as best you can, but then also building that capability at the individual level to help people understand, well, how am I coping with stress? Therefore, how resilient am I being? Um, it just, those two things, I think, Pandemic COVID has really let us see that there's an overlap between, you know, increasing the amount of change and the decline in mental well-being. And the intersection of both of those is where we need to focus our capability building within organizations. It's easier said than done. Um, particularly, you know, when we're all trying to make sure that we're reaching our budgets, that we're absolutely, you know, that we're turning that profit, we're keeping our shareholders happy. But at the end of the day, your most valuable asset are your people. And if they're being run into the ground, if they're not able to support themselves and their families, then you're really depleting your most important asset. Yeah, and we've we've got to look after those people we know that I think that's so, so important. Now, obviously, we're in a time where a lot of people are online and, and they talk about Zoom fatigue. So as a leader, how can we ensure that we are still getting in touch with each person uh, on a regular basis to check in and ask them, are they actually okay? Are you okay today? How can we do that effectively, Jessica? Well, it's just as important in terms of a strategy as how are we checking if we're on track with the project almost. Yeah, we're seeing now that the, that sort of, I guess, well-being strategy is just as important as checking on progress, checking on profit, because ultimately all of those are affected if, if my people aren't doing so okay, then the rest doesn't do okay. So there's very simple strategies, just like blocking the time into diary, um, just as important as some of the other things. As well, you may even consider, and I've heard, you know, some organizations, even my kids' school as well. So Fridays are a screen-free day. So no lessons are done online at school. They finish off what was done during the week. <laughs> so, um, and they actually really like that day. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Um, they've got all the screens they want, but it's all for lessons. So uh, there's, you know, simple things like that that can be done that culturally might need changing within organisations. And, you know, you as a leader perhaps need to lead that and be the first to do it. So just because others aren't in the organisation, you may say, well, we're going to experiment and see what it's like. Um, because you you yourself feel it. You yourself feel this fatigue and that the diary is continually full and it's just one after the other and there's not the time to actually get some of the work done. There's, this, there's the discipline within the self there and then taking the leadership within an organisation as well. So we, we've even noticed as well with a lot of other coaches out there uh, that obviously sometimes they will do work all by themselves. And so one thing that we've found is coaches are actually now literally just connecting with each other to say, hey, look, um, it, you know, twice a week, 
all they do, they just go on to Zoom together and they work together and they might be on two totally different separate projects, but it's just that feeling of feeling connected, even through a screen. And so even right now, uh, you know, in, in, in Victoria and New South Wales here in Australia, we've been locked down, you know, now for many, many weeks, but we, we can still feel connected. And that also that, that real human need of that feeling of sense of belonging by you just simply being brave enough to reach out to someone to say, hey, look, uh, let's connect regularly. Let, let's get online and, and, and let's work together. How can I help you or the like? Uh, and the more that we actually make an effort to, to reach out and, and even and collaborate, uh, the more that we're, we're going to see a lot greater you know, performance in a way and also certainly more happiness as well within our teams. It's, it's really interesting that sometimes we don't realise the effect we have on other people. And I've had a couple of people reach out to me, you know, in my life who I didn't know was struggling at the time, but they reached out just to say, thank you. And thank you for what you've done to help me be here today. And, and it's really interesting, you know, the importance of us, not just sharing all the happy things we're doing, but sharing the good and the bad and, and being able to be vulnerable as well. And so I know, Christiane, you do a lot of work on social media and you're talking to a lot of people. How important is it for you to show both the sides of the good things that are happening and how you can help people along, but also that vulnerability as well? It's imperative, Craig. I often term or coin the term, you know, vulnerability is power. It, vulnerability creates likability. Vulnerability creates relatability. For so long, traditionally, in corporate in particular, globally, it was about autocratic authoritarian type leadership. But I feel that vulnerability really opens up the opportunity for open dialogue within amongst individuals and teams. Yeah. Thank you, Christiane. Look, team, it's been it's been wonderful speaking with you today. And for everyone out there, you know, I just want each one of our team now just to share one tip to help you when when times might be a bit tough and you're struggling a little bit with life and you, you need something just to help you switch out of that and, and see feel the hope and see the bright light for the future. Uh, so I'll start first with you, uh, Diane. I'm going to be cheeky and take two things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would like to encourage people. So mental health first aid courses, like whether you're in an organisation or you're an individual yourself, go and do a mental health first aid course because it builds your education, it builds your language, it builds your knowledge. And it just means that you'll be in a position then to you know, observe some of the signs and hopefully be able to help and reach out to someone. So that's on that, what you can do for educating yourselves and for others. But also if you're a leader in an organization, to Christiane's point about being vulnerable, if you have a story to share, share it with your team because you set the example then through leadership and you're saying it's okay to talk about my mental health struggles therefore I'm creating that uh, you know that culture of having courage, courageous conversations within the organization that will help people open up to you. Yeah beautiful. Jessica? Yes it's two is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the benchmark's been set. <laughs> Um, I guess my first, not necessarily a strategy or anything, but my first uh, top one is always you're not alone. As we can see from just even this group here, it is, it's almost a, a rite of passage or part of the human condition that these things come and go in a way. And why it's so great that days like Are You OK have sprung up so that the conversation is more open. We're all like, oh, wow, you too? Oh, you too, right? And so it's less of a hide and more of a let's turn this into what we can learn about ourselves and the organisation perhaps. And my other biggest tip is go and play in nature and just notice the tree, notice the leaf. It sounds so simple, but jump in the ocean, whatever it might be, go and find nature and just play in nature. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Christiane? So I also have two. So something that I like to inspire and or implore in my clients and my communities is one of which it's good to talk. It's good to talk. 
and the other of which is, you know, express, don't suppress. And to go back to Sam's point about tribes and being at the top of the food chain, you know, if you want to go far, go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We're far, far stronger together. Yeah, I love it. Really, really good. Sam? Yeah, all right. Let's go to it as well. Just go on the trend. Uh, the first one here is uh, choose joy. Uh, joy for me is, is one of the most uh, powerful, intrinsic, internal motivations for us to actually, uh, you know, uh, lift our eyes up and look around. And so when we choose joy each day, then ultimately we can see the brightness uh, in each day. And the second thing, and I do talk a lot about this, and it's proximity is power. You know, uh, us as human beings, we do crave, uh, you know, that sense of feeling loved, that sense of being good enough, and also that sense of belonging. Uh, and, and, you know, what we know is that we are the average of our five closest friends. The company that we keep determine who we are. So, so for me, I'm going to choose the right type of proximity to spend time in, in order for that to raise, you know, my happiness, my positivity levels, uh, ultimately for me to literally just live a more fulfilled life. So proximity is power. Yeah, fantastic. All right. And, and for me, I think it's really, really important that you schedule your energy. So you need to be proactive in the way that you schedule your energy and also recovery. Uh, and the second one is, you know, obviously for a lot of you, you're working at home. It's really important that you just don't get stuck at that computer and go, okay, well, there's nothing else I can do. So I'll just keep working. What that will do is overwork yourself in the end. And you've got to let your brain relax and recover. You know, our brain is a, is a hugely important asset to us. So make sure we look after it. Mm -hmm. So thank you to Sam, Diane, Jessica, and Christiane today. It's been wonderful speaking to you about such an important message around are you okay? And for those around the world, we have World Suicide Prevention Day as well this week. And so it's really important that you reach out to people who, who may, who, who may their, their behaviors may have changed. We've noticed something a bit different, or maybe you just haven't spoken to them for a while. Why don't you just reach out and pick up the phone and give them a call and for yourself, just check in and go, hey, you know, what am I grateful for today? And also... Is everything okay? And if not, talk to someone. Thank you very much, everyone. Be safe. Talk to you soon.